happened with me doing not an awful lot of effort. I literally set up a profile, added a photo to my profile, connected it up to my Sunzu account, and suddenly it happened. So that was kind of a bit of a cue for me to explore what had happened. And when I started looking at other cool stuff that happens in search listings, these are YouTube videos. It's a really, really funny tribute video, Jim La La La. And you can see here there's a thumbnail, which tells you how long it is. It tells you when it was uploaded. It tells you the duration and who uploaded it. That's done through using the same kind of microdata that is um, added to a website to show your profile picture, which is what this one shows. So my picture and also how many Google Plus circles I'm in. So it's a measure of how many people have added me to their circles, not how many people I've added. So how many people think I'm authoritative enough to add me to a circle. And shrimp waffles, which is the uh, food of choice in the Joomla community. They're from Holland. I don't know if any of you have had them. They're like biscuits with caramel in them. Oh, they're really nice. Great on top of a cup of tea, and it melts the caramel and goes lovely. But anyway, uh, ratings number of people who've reviewed it, the time it takes to cook, and the number of calories. So perhaps not 600 calories. I'm not sure Simming World would like that too much. Um, so I, I got a week to weigh in. That's fine. And then the other one is um, events. And now this is fantastic. If you promote events, you wanna, and they're regular events, you want to try and upsell events. So this is telling me the next three events in a series of events that I go to. So I could then click on all three of those, open them in new tabs, and book for all three of them. This is in the search listing. So I haven't even looked at the website. I already know, oh, I know that person. That's somebody that I've seen somewhere else. Oh, I know that's got too many calories for me. I'll go for the lower calorie one. I know that it's been rated five, so it's going to be a good one. So I'm sure you can appreciate that once I started looking into how this was happening and what was happening, as a web developer, I'm thinking, wow, if I can do this for my clients and their customers, their uh, competitors aren't doing this, just imagine what could happen for their websites. Just imagine how much more they're likely to get clicked through. And there's a recent research study that says that about 30% higher click through rates with listings that have rich snippets. These additional bits of information are called rich snippets. And also, it can, as I noticed, it bumps you up in the rankings. So it was a bit of a no-brainer for me. It was something like, I really need to understand what's going on here. But that was swiftly preceded by this. <laughs> I have got so much going on. You're honestly telling me that I have to do a whole load more stuff in my website markup to make that happen. Unfortunately, yes. But as I say, it turned into sales. And for me, the return on investment was quite clear. If I spend a couple of days figuring out, A, how this happened, B, what I can do in my websites to make it work for other people and what, you know, get better benefits for me, then I'm going to end up having more sales. So that's what I'm trying to get across to other people, that microdata and semantic search especially, which is understanding the context of information, is something that's becoming extremely, extremely important, and it can help you with your business development. So we'll have a quick semantics 101. Um, any of you guys in the audience are web developers or web designers or do anything with the web? So hopefully you guys know, some of you who aren't web developers might know this. When you make a website, you have a H1 tag, which is the main heading. And then if you have other subheadings, you have H2, H3. So they kind of cascade down in order of importance. That's really, really basic contextual information. It's telling a search engine, which is effectively a machine, this is the main title of the website, of this page that you're looking at. This is the main title. This bit here is also a title, but it's not as important. This bit here is a subtitle of that and so forth. So that's the very, very basic semantic uh, markup. We use this to feed the machines. The machines are the ones that are trying to understand and interpret what's on your website. Machines can't really interpret things unless we give them the means to do that. And the means to do that is giving them semantic markup. The H1, H2, H3, that should be pretty much standard with every web developer. They, they should be doing that now. But you'd be surprised the number I see that don't. But there's some extra stuff we can add. People always say content is king. Content is king. But if I search for something, how does a search engine distinguish what I'm actually looking for? So in this case, if I search for the word avatar, 
I could be me. Any of you Ultima Online fans? You might be a bit too young for Ultima Online, but this is Avatar, an Ultima Online character. This is Avatar, my favorite movie. Avatar, this is an American cartoon series. Swedish death metal band. Any fans? I've literally never heard of a fan of them, so one day someone's going to go, yeah, I know who they are. I didn't. And the avatar that I use on a forum. So if I type into a search engine, avatar, how does it understand, A, what I'm asking, but B, when it sees avatar on a website, what that's actually referring to? How does it know whether it's a forum avatar of a person, whether it's the avatar of the movie, whether it's a music band, whether it's a cartoon? Now, search engines did something that's kind of unheard of. They all sat down in a room together and agreed on something, that they needed this information, they needed this contextual information, and they needed to give web designers a way of providing it that would mean that they could interpret it in the same way. Because you don't want web designers making up their own ways of telling a search engine what this information is. So they came together, and they made schema.org. If you have insomnia, this is a fantastic website. It is full of schemas that give you ways of explaining everything, pretty much everything you could ever want to explain in the world, literally. And it's very boring, but as a web developer, it's a useful resource. You can explain everything from volcanoes to people, to events, to movies, to anything, pretty much. And it lists the markup that you can use in your applications in your web software and so forth. So they said, why well, everything starts off as life as a thing. And a thing has a name, a URL, it might have an image. So that's common to everything that we're describing. But how schema.org works is then you have schemas that are specific to certain types of things. So we have creative work, product. These are just the main schemas. Intangible things, medical entities place, events, person, organization. So they're kind of like very broad categories. And then within each of those, there are more specific um, things that you can describe. So for example, Creative Schema has all of these. And you can see for web, de web design, there's quite a few in here. Article, blog, book, quite a few of these that, that come up quite regularly in a website. And they contain information that's relevant to those types of resources. So in the blog one, you would have things like the name of the article, the date it was written, uh, the subject matter, keywords, the category it's been published in, and so forth. If you're looking at a media object or a movie, then a movie might have the director, the actors, when was it published, was it based on a book, anything like that. So each schema has information you can tell search engines and other applications, specific information that is relevant to that. What's been quite exciting is that other applications are starting to use this. So you can put semantic data into emails that are sent out of your application, which Google now will pick up and make cards. So for example, it takes information about my hotel reservation and tells me where it is, gives me a map that I can click to get walking directions, tells me the check-in times, and so forth. So semantic information isn't only about being used on the web. It can also be used by applications. So how to use schema.org? This is probably a little bit more for the techies, so developers or uh, web designers. We first have to tell it that we're actually talking, we're giving it some semantic information, and then tell it which schema we're using. So are we talking about a movie? Are we talking about a person? Are we talking about a book? And so forth. So that basically says, use this reference. You give the URL to say, this is where the schema is that I'm referencing. And then you say, what about that you're actually describing? So you tell it whether you're describing uh, the name of the director, the genre of the movie, uh, information about the actors, and so forth. They're, each of those is a, what's called an item prop, an item property. And this can be written into templates. It can be written into layouts and so forth, so that you don't have to manually put this in every time. So it can be automated to some extent, and you can also add it on the fly. So if we just step through what this kind of markup would look like, this is how we open up the item scope and the item type. So we're saying we're using the movie schema that you find at schema.org slash movie. And when you go to that URL, you would find the schema and all the different properties that you're able to describe about a movie. 
We're saying that the name is Avatar, so it knows that the name of the movie is Avatar. The, the director, this one is interesting because we're talking about the director of a movie, but we're also obviously describing a person. So with, mark, with um, microdata markup, you can also nest another schema within the schema. So we're saying this is the person who is the director of the movie, but it's also a person that we're talking about. And the name of the director and the name of the person is James Cameron, and the birth date of the person is August 16th, 1954. Now, this is a bit of a deliberate error in my, my part, and nobody's picked it up yet. Uh, when you do dates, you have to provide them in the ISO format, so if you put it in this format, technically it's not correct. But anyway, that's just a semantic point. Um, genre, so this is going back to the movie schema. The genre is science fiction. And then we can include the link to a trailer. So that will also give information about the trailer. So if we have an example of Pirates of the Caribbean, a really poorly marked up page, because it's only got a H1 and no other markup. Um, if you were a machine reading this, you would go, OK, so that's the title, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides 2011. But from a machine's perspective, it knows nothing else about the contextual information you're providing at all. It just knows that you've given a title. It might look at the words and try and interpret them, but at the moment, it doesn't really understand what that is. So if we walk through how we would mark it up with schema markup, we open up the movie schema, which is what we were just looking at, and we say the name of the movie, Pirates of the Caribbean. Then we give a description, which is like a short piece of intratext, maybe a paragraph or so that tells you about the movie. We declare the director, and we also nest the fact that they're a person. So we can put in the fact that they're the person's name as well as the name of the director. And we do the same with author. And we say that they're a person. And we can do the same thing with actors. Believe it or not, they're people. Um, so each person, we're, we're declaring that they're a person. And they're the, also giving the name as an actor. And the aggregate rating schema allows you to do the stars that we looked at on the examples of rich snippets. What that does is basically says, the rating value that this has got at the moment is 8. The best rating it could get is 10. Um, the number of ratings is 200. OK? And it assumes, if you don't explicitly de declare it, it'll assume that the worst rating is 1. Um, and then we've got review count here, so the number of people who've reviewed. You can also mark up comments and things like that. There are schemas specifically for marking up comments. So the effect of this, and really the only reason I chose this movie was so that I could give a picture of Johnny Depp, but there we go. Um, you start to see these uh, stars appearing for the rating, um, the number of people who voted it, the rating out of 10. This one is a slightly different one because it uses a percentage and the number of reviews. But also we have the information saying it's directed by and starring at the bottom. And then what can happen is you, if the, there's information that matches that, semantic information in publicly uh, available sources, generally Wikipedia, then a knowledge graph may appear on the right-hand side. It doesn't always happen, but it does sometimes happen. So you can see here the information that it's gleaned from Wikipedia about this search query. So that's a really powerful way of actually using semantic markup to give extra information. Because if somebody's searching for Pirates of the Caribbean, they might actually be interested in Johnny Depp. And this gives them a link through to the Wikipedia page for Johnny Depp. So does that make sense? Is everybody with me so far? Just about. OK. So the, the microdata that I got really interested in was authorship. And authorship is Google's attempt to try and um, associate content that's written on the web with a person to figure out how authoritative that person is in the subject matter about which they're writing. So anybody could go out and write an article about entrepreneurship. How do you know that the person writing it isn't some 15-year-old in his back room who's just scraped the content off of Wikipedia? You know, how do you actually know? How does a search engine, effectively a machine, know that that person is reputable in that field? And the way that Google is going about that is through using authorship. 
Now, here's an example of authorship in action. This is an article that I've written on the Joomla community magazine about why you can't afford to ignore Google+. And here at the top, you'll see, where's my pointer? You'll see my name is hyperlinked. And at the bottom of the article, there's also a bio, which gives a link back to my profile page. On my profile, I've got the link to Google+. And the markup at the end of it has question mark rel equals author. And that means relationship of this article. This link is the author. And then in my Google Plus profile, I have a contributor to section, which allows me to say which websites I actually write on. OK, so in here, I have the Joomla Community Magazine as a link to say I'm an author on that website. And when these two things happen, so it's a reciprocal thing. You have to have a link with rel equals author on the website, on the article that you've written. And that domain must be in your contributes to section of your Google Plus profile. You start to get the, uh, your face staring back at you in search listings effect. So your avatar, providing you have a head and shoulders shot of you in your Google Plus profile, your avatar starts to appear next to your search listings. It'll only appear once. If you've got like five listings on the same page, it'll appear against the first one. But it also says by your name, so by Ruth Cheesley, and it says how many Google Plus circles you're in. And in America, because they always get things before us, which is extremely frustrating, but such is life, you also get more by this author. OK? So you can see visually that makes a big difference. But also, if you, read, if you know of an author or you read an article about something and you think, wow, this pe person really knows their stuff, when you click on more by Ruth Cheesley, it gives you a filtered down list of all the articles that I've written on the web that are associated to me as the author. So everything that has authorship markup that's linking to my Google Plus profile. And again, this tells you how many people have me in their Google Plus, prof in their Google Plus circles. But it has to have that two-way communication. You have to actually list it in your Google Plus profile, because otherwise anybody could say that I'd written the article. But I actually have to say that I write on that domain for the authorship to work. So this is what made me kind of start take, paying attention. And it really does make a difference to people who write about subjects, especially if you write about something and you're very knowledgeable about that subject. Because it's starting, if, it's, if there's a breaking story, the people who have the authorship markup and who write regularly about that topic, you guarantee they're the ones that are going to go up in the rankings above people who are less authoritative and who don't, write, uh, who don't have authorship markup. And they're going to get clicked on because they look pretty and they stand out, generally. So why bother? And I think you can probably understand from what I've been saying, like the brand association with your brand, people knowing what it is that you do, people recognizing you. So before they even click on that link, if they already recognize your face, that's a trusted relationship. They might not, if they hadn't seen your face, they might not have realized that that website is to do with you. They might not have realized that you're the person who's written that article. So seeing your picture gives them that um, bit more information about who wrote that article. And Google Plus is where it starts. How many of you guys are on Google Plus already? A few of you. Recommend you all do especially if you're interested in developing your reputation and connecting with some pretty cool people. Um, so Google Plus profile is where it all starts for authorship. You have to have one. You can't do it with any other profile. Um, it's very easy to set up. Um, you can have a nice picture at the top, or you, you can use it for branding and marketing. But I generally, etiquette is that you have something that's important to you or relevant to you. For me, this is a lock in Scotland where I go and retreat over the new year. And this is my profile picture. This is the one that will appear in the search listing. So it's important that it's a good photo of you. Uh, don't put a photo of your dog or anything like that. It needs to be a photo of you. Google Plus is very much about people. It's very much about try, trying to replicate what happens in human society in computers so that they can start to understand the social signals that we would normally use offline. You, if you were going to go and buy a car, would you buy it from a salesman who's trying to push a sale down your throat? Or would you buy it from somebody who you have a trusted relationship with who probably knows a little bit about cars and that you trust? 
you, you probably take the advice from somebody that you have a relationship with and, and that's authoritative in that area. So it's definitely something that you need to, um, to look into. I'm not, in, I'm not paid by Google Plus, just for information. Um, the tagline and the introduction bits are the bits that really need to be optimized. The tagline needs to be very short and snappy because you only get 35 characters when you hover over someone's name. So it's a great opportunity to tell people what you do, what, you do, what your interests are. And the introduction, you can have follow links in there. So they actually pass link traffic through to your website. So you could point people at your website, you could point people at a resource that you've written that's relevant, all kinds of things, give people information. Um, and you can put your work information, your employment history, and so forth. Adding your author markup on your website is pretty easy. Um, it really is, even for non-developers. Um, it's very simple. You add a link to your Google Plus profile on the pages that you want to have authorship show. So it's not necessarily appropriate to have a picture and have an author associated with every single page on your website. It tends to be content that's curated by someone. So news section, press releases, uh, blogs, that kind of thing. Yes, appropriate. About us page, probably less so. Um, and to do that, all you have to do is put a link to your Google Plus profile. And this can be hidden. It doesn't have to actually show on the website. It could be a hidden link. Um, put in your profile URL and then append question mark relic was author on the end. And that tells the search engine the author of this content is this URL, this Google Plus person. Then, as I mentioned before, you have to add in the domain that you're writing on into the contributes to section. If you, if you write on subdomains, so I write on community.joomla.org and magazine.joomla.org, then both those subdomains have to be listed. But you don't have to list every single page that you write on on the domain. So this is the contributes to section in your Google Plus profile. You can also say if it's a current place that you write or if it's a past place that you write. So if you used to write at a certain website but you don't anymore, you can tick a box or untick a box and say, I don't write there anymore. And I've got a couple of places that either don't exist or I don't write there anymore as an author. The other thing that Google's implemented is something called publisher markup. And this is not really actively been using, but used at the moment. But the potential is um, that it will allow a business brand page on Google Plus to be associated with content on the web. And so the way that we use this is that all the content on our website is published by my company. So we have Relic was publisher on all the content across the website. At the moment, it isn't, work, it isn't being used. But at some point, we anticipate they will have a similar thing to the authorship in that you will have the company logo or something along, or written by something along those lines. So then your company starts to be well known for writing about Joomla, for writing about open source, and so forth, as well as the people, individual people. That's the way I see this going. But as I say, it is still in development. And it's very similar to what we just did with authorship. You have the URL here of the page at this point, the Google Plus page for your business, and rel equals publisher rather than rel equals author. And on your Google Plus page, you put your website link, and then you verify it, basically. So again, it's a two-way link. You say that I'm the publisher of this content, and you add that domain as your website URL. So here's some examples of profile linking in action. This is my personal website, ruthgc.co.uk. And here's the link to my personal website and contributes to. And you can see that my picture and all of my information is posted there. Why you should be paying attention to Google Plus. So this is an article I wrote in, on magazine.joomla.org. And that's listed in my contributes to section here. This is my profile page on Sun Tzu, which is the first one that made me sit up and notice. And that's listed here. So same image, because it just pulls the image from your Google Plus profile. When you connect this up, it starts happening almost immediately. It starts happening very, very quickly. Sometimes there can be a delay if you change your photo. But generally, it happens pretty quickly. This is the view all by author that I mentioned. So all the pages that it knows or it thinks it knows are written by me. And when you do that, it also pulls in the information it knows about you from public sources. I'm not famous enough to have a Wikipedia article yet. So it pulls in the information from my Google Plus stream. But if there is somebody who's famous, 
It also pulls in their Google Plus stream, their recent posts, books that they've written. So it's pulling in information about books they've written. So you can see the potential for selling there. And also, it's telling me that people who search for Guy Kawasaki also search for these people. So you might also be interested in searching for these people as well. So that's quite a clever use of understanding what people are interested in, understanding that people who search for this also search for that. And when you click on one of those people, you get this nice image carousel at the top, which is visually pretty amazing. I mean, it looks very different to what you get normally in Google+. So it, it directs your eye. And these are the people that people also search for. When I click on the person, it gives me the information about their Google Plus page. And at the bottom, it will also tell me people who search for Robert Scoble also search for, et cetera. So this is how things are moving in, web, in the world of semantic search. And it, it's really important to actually keep up with the uh, wave, so to speak. So to talk about how we're doing things with Joomla, because Joomla is what I know very well, is what I'm involved in all the time. Um, it's been a bit of a battle for me speaking publicly at conferences since November last year to get developers to actually understand the importance of microdata and to understand not only the importance of microdata, but the benefits it could give to the people who are using their extensions, people who are using their templates, to the web developers who don't necessarily know about microdata. If we can put it in there for them that they don't have to do anything about it, it's going to help their clients without them realizing. So I've been doing a lot of kind of speaking at conferences and things, trying to get uh, web developers on board. A lot of the time I start speaking about SEO and you can just see the light go down. You know, I'm a developer, I don't care about search engines, but they do have to. And I've had to learn a bit about being a developer in order to be able to speak to them, which is challenging. Um, there are so many opportunities on in Joomla websites and in any website, really. All these types of websites, all these types of areas you might find on a site, you could mark up with microdata. So it, the potential is there, but it was just a case of, well, how do we do this? Like, there are millions of sites around the world using Joomla. How, do we, how can we find a way of putting microdata into Joomla that would suit everybody? Because not every website is going to be an article. Not every website is going to be a blog. So we can't manually specify um, blog, article, website, volcano. For, you know, We can't just force that on people. Um, so the first step was, here's one I made earlier. We started writing template overrides that had microdata in them. And that suits, that suits a purpose to a certain extent. But we still have people saying, yeah, but my website isn't an article. It's about musicians. And so I don't want to use the article schema. I want to use the musician schema for every page. So that was quite clear that it, it, it meets about 50% of the people's needs. Um, but it, it's not great for the project going forward for the wide range of sites that Joomla powers. So we then started scratching our heads, and I started buying developers' beers and talking to them and trying to figure out how can we get this into Joomla in a way that people can ba basically pull whatever they need from the schema markup, and it will throw the microdata in, properly format it. Because as I mentioned earlier, dates have to be in ISO format, but you don't want to put a string of numbers as a date for the public viewing a website. They want to know 1st to 2nd of September. They don't want to know a load of numbers. So yeah, lots of beers, lots of conversations, lots of, hmm, how are we going to do this? And then we had the Google Summer of Code. Anyone here involved in Google Summer of Code? No? OK, we have a Google Summer of Code project that's running at the moment in the Joomla project, um, which, is, which is based on improving the accessibility of Joomla and improving the semantic information of Joomla. So this guy, P. Alex, well, his name is P. Alex. Um, I can't really pronounce his full name, but he likes to be called P. Alex, um, is writing a microdata library which basically, this is the first draft of how the microdata library was going to work. It will function as an API-based system so that developers can just query it and pull in the information. They don't need to know the microdata markup that's done by the library. They just pull in what they want to use. We've been having discussions in the last few days about the fact that we might not always be using schema.org. There are other ways of using microdata. So we can use RDFA, which has just been accepted by W3C. So this method is a bit restrictive because it assumes that you're using schema. 
but there are other schemas that we could use. So we're adapting it slightly so that we'll, it will use the same kind of system, but there's the potential to choose different schemas going forward. So this is going to be, as I say, an API-based system that extension developers can actually pull into and get the information, and it will throw the information back out into their extensions. So it's a real step forward for us. And semantic search and semantic information is becoming so important that it's something that big content management systems, open source projects, things that you guys are thinking about really need to be on the ball with. We really need to start giving contextual information, not only the basic text, but also what it actually means. And also, if any of you guys are interested, he, um, P. Alex said, check out the GitHub link because he's more than happy to have conversations and have people help contribute with the code. Joomla itself is also on GitHub. We have a bug squad, which is formed of volunteers around the world who help to contribute to Joomla, fix bugs, get it up to date, add new features. We've got some amazing features coming in 3.2. So it's a great opportunity if any of you are PHP, MySQL developers to uh, yeah, get involved with an international project. So in review, Microdata lets you add context to your web-based content, but also to apps and other things. Search engines are able to actually use that information, that contextual information that you provide, and they can, note can rather than will, uh, make rich snippets in listings. So they aren't necessarily using every single possible declaration in schema.org. But there's no harm in actually providing it, because there's every possibility that they might in the future. And areas where this is being really uh, well used are the medical areas. Authorship is a type of microdata which links content to a user. So that gives users the ability to develop their own reputation, develop their own profile and to be attributed for the content that they actually write in search engines. The sticking point for us at the moment in Joomla is we have the Joomla Community Magazine, which is a community-driven uh, magazine. We have probably about 40 to 50 articles every month, and we have a Spanish version. And the problem is that when a Spanish person translates an English article, they become the author, because they've written it, but Google wants the original author to be the author. So I'm trying to find out at the moment a way of working around that without upsetting a lot of Spanish people, which quite frankly terrifies me. Um, many websites don't include microdata by default. If you're not sure if yours does, if you search for a structured query data tool or rich snippets testing tool, um, you will be able to stick the URL in there, hit go, and it will tell you what semantic information it can find. So have a go if you guys have websites, or just try it on some big websites, because you'd be really surprised the number of really big websites that don't have markup for semantics. And also, the positive is that Joomla will soon ship with JMicroData. We're hoping it will be in the next release, 3.2, but if not, it will be in 3.3. So for more information, schema.org, as I say, that's the one that's got all of the schemas on there. You can find out how you can describe pretty much everything that you'd ever want to describe, and some things you probably wouldn't. Um, Plus.google.com slash authorship gives you information about how to set up authorship, how to troubleshoot it, and so forth. Microdata for Joomla, if you're interested in um, the template overrides and so forth. We've got um, overrides for Joomla 3 for free with all the microdata in it. And if you want to connect with me on Google+, I'm on gplus.to slash rcheesley. That's a quick URL just to get to my Google Plus profile. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. If, you have, if anyone has questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and I'll be around for a bit afterwards. So if anybody wants to come and grab me, then yeah, do shout. Any questions, guys? Put your hands up. about how to avoid the vulnerability problems, the, w the best way to, to protect when, uh, uh, to protect about the vulnerabilities. Do you mean with Joomla specifically? Uh, the, last w the last one announced about two weeks ago, uh -huh. like that. So, well, what, so the question is, what's the best way to protect, say, to protect, Joomla uh, against example, vulnerabilities? Yes. Update it. 
updated. Updated. Update the, the majority of hacked websites that we see are people who do not update it. We at Joomla has a, a security strike team. So it's a team of developers who specialize in security stuff. If we get a report of a vulnerability that comes in, that we don't obviously go, hey, look, here's the vulnerability, and we're working on fixing it. Because then as soon as you do that, everybody knows the vulnerability, and they'll start attacking websites. What happens is that information comes into the strike team. They look at it. They provide a fix. They provide a patch for the versions that we currently support. And that is then released with the vulnerability information. So as soon as an update comes out, if it's a security announcement, the, mo the most important thing is to update. But the other thing is also that Joomla is not only about Joomla. Joomla uses extensions and bolt-ons and plugins and templates. Sometimes some of those have security vulnerabilities. We have something called the Vulnerable Extensions List, which is vel.joomla.org, the vel, as we call it. Um, Any time a vulnerability is found or reported, it goes on there, immediately goes on there. And the developers are given time to actually reply and fix it so that they can fix the vulnerability before it goes on. That extension is pulled from the extensions directory with a warning saying that it's currently vulnerable until such a time as a patch is released. So the same thing goes for your extensions. You need to keep them up to date, because if a patch is released for a vulnerability and you haven't updated it, then you're still vulnerable. And actually, with, you know, we've had servers compromised because clients have updated their main website, but they have a dev, uh, development domain. And they have the same extensions on the development domain, but they haven't updated them when a security patch has come out. So you know, with the best will in the world, Joomla can keep itself as secure as possible, but we have the users in mind that have to actually engage with updating their sites. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. um, the last update that came out actually was affected all versions of Joomla, 1.5, 2.5, and 3. 1.5 isn't supported anymore. So the patch for 1.5 was written by the community. Some uh, people in the community wrote the patch for that. At the moment, that we've got a long-term support of 2.5 and a short-term support release of 3. Does that help? Any more questions, guys? Thank you, Ruth, um, for that really clear and informative um, talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. A round of applause for Ruth Cheesley.